Welcome to this first lecture of ME309, the Introductory Fluid Mechanics course. My name is Carl Wasker, and I'm going to be the professor for this, for this uh, set of lectures. Um, at this very first lecture, I want to cover just a few topics. The first thing I'm going to do is just give you a little introduction as to why we study fluid mechanics. Uh, the second thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about applications of fluid mechanics. Uh, that kind of goes along with the first topic. And then we'll review the syllabus and a couple of other documents. So go ahead and take a look at your screen. You see here a picture of some flow visualization, actually, of an aircraft that's uh, very close to flying very close to the ground. And you see this beautiful uh, wingtip vortice that's coming off the, the aircraft. So they, what they did is they put some smoke, uh, smoke bombs, basically, on the ground, released this red smoke, and they had the plane fly through it. So you could visualize the vortice that comes off the wingtip here. The reason you get this vortex is because on the bottom side of the wing, you have a high pressure region. The upper side of the wing is a lower pressure region. It's that difference in pressures that gives the aircraft lift, keeps it up off the ground, right? We have a higher pressure on the bottom, lower pressure on the top. And around the wing tip, what happens is that, low, that high pressure air on the bottom kind of sneaks around toward the, the top low pressure, right? It, since it's at higher pressure, it'll move into the low pressure region, and it produces that vortex that comes off the wing tip that you see right here. So kind of a neat, uh, neat photograph. I thought it was a beautiful one that I'd just go ahead and share. So let's go ahead and talk about why we study fluid mechanics. Um, there are a number of reasons for it. For, first of all, the, the most uh, you know, pragmatic reason is it's part of the mechanical engineering curriculum. Basically, every ME program uh, in the world will have a course on fluid mechanics. It's just one of the fundamental topics in mechanical engineering that you have to have some exposure to. Just like knowing something about math, something about physics, thermodynamics, um, so, uh, strength of materials, things like that. Fluid mechanics is just one of those topics. We like for undergraduates to have a pretty broad base of knowledge because we don't know where everyone's going to be when they graduate. Some people will go and study uh, things more related to solid mechanics. Some will study things related to thermodynamics. And some of you will study things related to fluid mechanics. Uh, we just don't know where everyone's going to end up, and nor do most of you know where you're going to end up. So it's good to have a, a nice foundation. So that's one reason that you study the topic. The second reason that you study it is because it introduces some ideas about using control volumes and applying um, some basic principles to those control volumes. Now, you did a little bit with control volumes in thermodynamics. You applied the first law to control volumes. You did conservation of mass to a control volume. I also did uh, the second law applied to a control volume. In this course, you'll also do linear momentum applied to control volumes. And you'll deal both with big control volumes, macroscopic control volumes, the kind of control volumes you dealt with in thermodynamics. But then we'll also shrink those control volumes to very small size, differentially small, infinitesimally small. And we'll apply conservation of mass and linear momentum to those tiny little control volumes too. So we'll, we'll do that. And then we'll uh, apply some of those ideas to study more specific topics like boundary layers and pipe flows, um, uh, compressible flows, things of that nature. Okay, so, so there are going to be some physical concepts that you learn in this course that you won't get in other courses. And it's really just applying basic fundamental principles, conservation of mass, Newton's second law, um, you know, the first law, applying those to fluid mechanics systems. Okay, let me now let's just talk a little bit about some applications of fluid mechanics. If you take a look at your screen, uh, I've shown a, a bunch of pictures that I pulled off the web just to show a variety of places where fluid mechanics appears. So now some of these will be pretty obvious. For example, in the upper left here, we have a picture of a jet engine. Obviously, a lot of fluid mechanics principles there uh, from kind of the macroscopic scale where you have flow coming into the engine and flow going out of the engine and from that you can actually calculate the thrust all the way down to the the differential scale when you start looking at the flow around the compressor blades and fan blades turbine blades uh, the combustion that goes on in the engine all of that involves fluid mechanics so you'll learn some of the basic principles in this course to be able to to study uh, more complex systems like this kind of jet engine of course aircraft design uh, that field is also uh, referred to as aerodynamics, but aerodynamics and fluid mechanics are, are I virtually identical, except in aerodynamics, you study the flow of gases. Uh, fluid mechanics is perhaps a little more general, involves liquids and gases as well. 
Uh, here we have a rocket. Of course, a lot of fluid mechanics involved in rocket design. A lot of compressible uh, fluid dynamics is involved there. Uh, here we have a ship. So there, that area of study is called um, hydrodynamics. It's just fluid mechanics, but applied to liquids. Aerodynamics is applied to air. Uh, hydrodynamics is typically applied to water or liquids. And you have a submarine here, which is kind of the same idea as a ship, you know, just looking at how things flow um, in, in water. This one, you probably don't really have a good idea what that picture is. That's a fluidized bed, a, com a computer simulation of a fluidized bed. Fluidized beds show up a lot in chemical processing, food processing industries. Um, what you're seeing in this picture is uh, the, the colors correspond to the concentration of solid particles. So a fluidized bed, it's basically you have some uh, particles in, a, in a, like a cylindrical container kind of shown here, and then you, you pass uh, typically um, heated gases up through the bottom. Right, so you have gases coming up through the bottom, and what they do is they fluidize the particles in that container. So they start to, to mix around, and what you're seeing here is regions of blue are low concentrations of particles, and regions of red are high concentrations of particles. So the, there's an upward flow of air in each of these. There's just different uh, air velocities coming up in each of the simulations. And you start to see kind of what are, what are known as bubbles in these fluidized beds. The, they're just air pockets that go through the fluidized bed. The reason they use air flu, uh, fluidized beds is because it, you can get a lot of mixing occurring in those, so they use them to, to mix materials. Um, you get, they use them for chemical reactions because you can have the, uh, the gas react with the particles. Uh, you can use it for drying. If you have sticky, wet particles, the, the, you can pass hot, dry air through it to dry them out. And you can use them for what's called granulation, where if you have sticky particles and you want them to stick together to form agglomerates or, or bigger particles, Fluidized beds are used for that, so the fluidizing air gets the particles to move and collide with one another and then stick together. So fluid mechanics obviously is involved there. Here we have a dam, some obvious applications of, of fluid dynamics. Study of weather, like uh, the hurricane that you see here. Automotive design, both just on the, the, the styling of the vehicle as well as a lot of the parts inside the vehicle. You know, just the, the, um, the heating and cooling systems within the car. Uh, how fuel moves through the car, all the, the fluid mechanics of the combustion in, the, um, in an internal combustion engine. Uh, quite a bit of fluid mechanics just in automotive design. Here we have, uh, looks like a, an oil refining facility or a chemical plant. Um, it's tough to tell. Um, but anyway, a lot of fluid mechanics in dealing with processing of chemicals, gas, oil. Here we have a picture of... Um, an artificial heart. So fluid mechanics, um, you know, in, in the design of an artificial heart, you know, how does how does blood flow through uh, the circulatory system? Uh, there's a, studies on how people breathe and the airflow into the lungs and such. So when they design like powdered uh, inhalers or things like that. So a lot of biofluid mechanics. This one is kind of a weird one. I, I'm not sure if you can tell what that is, but that's the inside of a uh, a dishwasher. So just in home appliances, uh, anything that involves drying or uh, wetting of materials and such, uh, there's fluid mechanics there. So this is the inside of a dishwasher. This one is making drumsticks. It's kind of a, an ice cream treat. So in a lot of food processing, they deal with some very unusual kinds of fluids, things that have unusual, what we call rheology, just fluid mechanics behavior. But a lot of fluid mechanics in the processing of foods. This one is a, a baseball that's spinning, and you can see the flow patterns around the baseball. So a lot of sports, um, uh, the physics of sporting um, equipment is, is widely studied. So like the physics of golf balls, and baseballs, even soccer balls, things like that. Just trying to understand how those uh, balls behave as you change the seam design or the dimple pattern, things of that nature. Here's another home appliance. This is a, a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Uh, you may, I'm not quite sure when these Dyson vacuum cleaners came out, but um, it was kind of a revolution when they came out. Prior to, the, to these um, Cyclone-style vacuum cleaners, they were all just kind of bag vacuum cleaners. And then um, Dyson basically took the idea of what's known as a cyclone separator. Cyclone separators just separate dusty air into just air in, in the dust particles. They're used all the time uh, in like wood shops and such. If you look outside the 
uh, a wood shop building, you'll see a big cyclone separator out there that'll take all that sawdust in, in the air and then separate it out into the dust, the sawdust actually collecting into a barrel and then the air gets discharged. So Dyson just basically shrunk that idea to make these vacuums. Here, of course, we have some wind turbines for producing um, green energy. That's a big topic right now. And uh, if you go outside of West Lafayette, you'll see a, a just, you know, if you go north and a little bit west of West Lafayette, you'll see a lot of wind turbines. This one might be tough to tell, but this is actually coating sprays on pharmaceutical tablets. That's something I have some research experience with. Basically, uh, all the pharmaceutical tablets that you take have some sort of coating on them. That coating can either be for aesthetic purposes, just to make it look pretty, or functional purposes, so it, it actually affects the, the release of the drug in your body. And so they have to apply those kinds of coatings, and they do it in these rotating drums where the tablets are tumbling around in the drum, and then they put spray on the surface. So this, this drum would be rotating around in this kind of uh, counterclockwise manner, and then they spray the coating on the surface of the tablets. So I just wanted to, to choose you know, a wide variety of applications where fluid mechanics is applied. And you can see it's, it's not just in designing aircraft or jet engines or rockets, but it shows up all over the place, places that you might not have expected, like you know, the manufacturing of food or pharmaceuticals, uh, sports equipment, home appliances. You know, it's a wide, wide spectrum of things where fluid mechanics is applied. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced that you know, it's, it's uh, not only a useful topic, but an interesting one, and many different applications. And what you'll get out of this course is just the basic principles. Now, this is just one semester of fluid mechanics. All you'll get here is really the, just the basics. You know, when you leave this course, you're not suddenly going to be an expert in fluid mechanics and you can solve every problem you come across, but you'll have the fundamentals where you'll understand the principles of most problems that you encounter. Um, and then you might need a little bit of extra study to get to, to refine those interests, to, to, to learn a little bit more, get a deeper understanding. Um, and you get that from a, a, another course, so like a second course in fluid mechanics. But you will get a, a, a nice foundation in this course. Okay. Let's go ahead and now talk about the, the uh, course syllabus. So uh, this course syllabus really is just for my section of flu fluid mechanics. Uh, Professor Scalo and Morris also will use the syllabus. Professor Castiano, um, Castillo sorry, uh, will be using a different syllabus. It'll be very similar to this one, but it'll be a different one. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the details of the syllabus, but I want to highlight a few things, especially because ME309 this semester is quite a bit different from previous semesters due to the, the COVID restrictions, and so I want to highlight some of those things. First of all, for my lecture, um, there is a face-to-face -face section of this course. It'll be on Monday, excuse me, Mondays and Fridays from 2.30 to 3.20 in ME 1130. Now, there's no face-to-face -face on Wednesday, and only half the class will be there on Monday, and the other half will be there Friday. We have to do that to keep the population density to, um, to below a certain point. Those face-to-face -face meetings will not present, I won't present new material in those. It'll just be a question and answer format. Uh, I'll show up, nothing prepared. I'll just see if you have any questions. If there are no questions, we'll just walk right back out of the room. Or as soon as the questions end, we'll leave. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna prepare anything. You, you need to come to me with questions. I'll uh, try to record those and post them. So if you can't make it to those face-to-face -face meetings, you can still see them online. I also will have um, an online sort of tutorial room that I'll monitor and I, I'll answer questions there as well. So if you're uncomfortable showing up to lecture, lecture, I should put it in quotes, uh, if you're uncomfortable showing up to that face-to-face -face section, it's not that big a deal. Uh, I'll handle uh, everything as much as I can online. Um, I just don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable coming to class. Okay, uh, anything to do with the lab that is handled by Professor Vlachos. He is the instructor in charge of all the labs, so I'm not going to say anything about that here. If you have any questions about the lab, talk to Professor Vlachos. Uh, personnel are all listed here. It's, this is my email address. That's the best way to get a hold of me if you have something uh, private you want to talk to me about. Office hours, again, I'll, I'll deal with um, answering questions as much as possible on uh, Piazza, that'll be our tutorial room, our, our online tutorial room. But if there's something private you want to talk to me 
kind of, um, you know, in person, we, we can set up a Zoom meeting um, at a mutually agreeable time, and I can talk to you that way. So if you have something that you really need to talk to me about privately, sort of face-to-face, -face, we'll do that virtually. Send me an email, and we'll, we'll put something together. There are a bunch of TAs for the class. They'll handle things like grading of homework and proctoring quizzes and, and um, grading laboratory reports and quizzes, etc. cetera. Uh, and I just give all their information here. That You're welcome to ask them questions in addition to any of the instructors. You don't always have to just come to me with your questions. You can ask the other instructors as well. The textbook, uh, we'll be using the Fox and McDonald Introduction to Fluid Mechanics. I've mentioned the, the ninth edition. Um, it's okay if you have an earlier edition like the eighth edition. Uh, it's just that when I give the schedule, the page numbers are going to be the page numbers for the ninth edition. One of the TAs, uh, uh, Josie, she uh, did do a conversion between the ninth and eighth edition page numbers, and I'll post that online. Um, I just haven't posted it yet, but you'll, you'll want to take a look for that if you have the eighth edition. I say that the textbook is recommended, but I should probably say that it's very highly recommended. Don't rely on just me for learning fluid mechanics. You know, I'm, I'm one resource. Your textbook is another resource. Uh, and the library is filled with all kinds of other um, textbooks on fluid mechanics, as well as the, the web has a lot of information on fluid mechanics. So make use of alternate resources. Don't just rely on one source. And as far as some of those other resource uh, references, I, I list some of them here. I also have some textbook style notes available on the web for free. Um, I have a link to those from the ME309 Brightspace page, so you might want to take a look at that and download it. it it's a huge file, so I should warn you in advance. That, those set of notes cover uh, thermodynamics, like ME200, ME309, and then uh, graduate level fluid mechanics, that's ME509, and graduate level gas dynamics, that's ME510. So it's, it's really four courses in one big set of notes. Um, so don't be alarmed when you download. It's like 1,700 pages. It's a huge amount. It's not all for ME309. Um, it covers a wide range of things. All right. Uh, the learning objectives for the course. Uh, we want to make sure that you um, understand uh, fluid mechanics principles. So this is kind of the, the physics of fluid mechanics. We want you to be able to create and analyze models for fluid mechanics systems and interpret the results from those models to make engineering recommendations. So when you see something in the real world, some, some physics, some, some real system, what I want you to be able to do when you leave this course is to translate that into mathematics, manipulate it mathematically, make some prediction, and then use that prediction to uh, make a decision in the real world. Okay? So that's what a lot of engineering modeling is, is, is just translating the real world into mathematics, making a prediction, and then using that prediction to make a decision in the real world. Uh, I want you to be able to communicate written analyses in a clear manner. That really comes down to the lab reports and the homework. Uh, when you prepare your solutions for homework or your lab reports, they need to be written well. Uh, it's a very important part of any um, engineering career is you need to be able to communicate with other people. And it's a good idea to practice that here in ME309 as well as any of your other courses. The, to write well, you have to practice and you have to have good practice. So it's a good idea to practice here where the stakes are low rather than in your job later on where the stakes are much higher. Okay, so, so just practice those skills here. It'll pay off. And then the last learning objective is to conduct simple experiments and analyze experimental data. That's really the lab portion of the course. Uh, I won't say anything about prerequisites. Let's go on to computer usage. A lot of computer usage this semester. Uh, first of all, you'll need to use Brightspace. Um, that's where we're going to store, you know, most of the course material, like the syllabus and do other documents. They'll all be on Brightspace. Homework, uh, homework assignments will be posted there. Homework solutions will be posted there. So you'll want to take a look at Brightspace. Piazza is going to be used for our tutorial room. So if you have questions about lecture material, homework, quizzes, labs, you can ask that on Piazza. Other students can help answer those questions. The TAs and instructors will monitor and answer questions there. Um, so make use of Piazza. Gradescope will be used for submitting and returning and grading assignments. So we'll use that for our homeworks, quizzes, and I believe the labs as well. YouTube, that's where my videos will be. They'll be on YouTube, so you'll want to 
I have that. Zoom will be used extensively for proctoring quizzes. So we'll have, I'll say more about the quizzes in a moment, but we'll have quizzes once a week and they need to be proctored and we'll do that via Zoom. Okay, so everybody will need to use Zoom um, for those quizzes and we'll talk more about that uh, later. Uh, we also may use Zoom or WebEx for office hours. Um, you know, some faculty will, you know, or you know, if you have like a face-to-face -face meeting with a faculty member, you'll use one or the other, probably. And then any email I send out will be through your Purdue email address, so make sure you check that frequently. In addition, uh, you might need to use some word processing, spreadsheets, maybe some basic programming to solve some of the assignments and some of the lab work. Okay, so. Um, that might be Excel, MATLAB, maybe Python, um, things like that. I already mentioned the tutorial room. Uh, we won't have face-to-face -face tutorial rooms. It'll all be online primarily through Piazza. The attendance policy, um, you know, uh, I'm not going to read through the whole thing here, but obviously we're dealing with uh, COVID situation, so it's possible that some people may not be able to make it to class. I've tried to... Um, make accommodations for that in the way that will grade things. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. If you miss class, well, first of all, don't come to class if you're sick, obviously. Um, and if you do miss classes, if, if it's more than, you know, a couple of weeks, just let me know. Well, first of all, let me know as soon as you're sick so we can start making preparations. And if, um, if it goes on for a long time, we'll work something out for you, okay? You just need to let me know so we can deal with it. Those are be kind of like a... Um, one by one situations. I'll just have to, to work with individuals to try to make it all work out. Academic integrity. This is actually a big issue, um, especially last semester we had some, some real problems in ME200, the thermodynamics course. There were quite a few people who were found cheating on the final exam and uh, they got F's on the final exam. So they got zeros actually and many of them ended up failing the class as a result. Um, if we have evidence that you're cheating um, we'll pursue it. It's our obligation to pursue it. Okay, it's not a judgment call on our part. It's just we have to do it if there's evidence of it. So don't cheat. It's just not going to be worth it. Okay, and I'll say more. I have another document that talks a little bit about academic integrity, but um, you know, not only so. So the, the policy here will be if you get caught cheating on the homework, then you'll get a zero for the entire homework score. If you get caught cheating on a quiz, it's just an automatic F for the whole semester. Okay, even if it happens one time, even if it's a small mistake, you know, let's say you just accidentally uh, use an unauthorized resource on one of the quiz, uh, quizzes for one of the problems. If we have evidence of it, it's an F for the entire course. So don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, it, it it'll be a real black mark on your record. So don't don't let that happen. Non-discrimination statement, accessibility statement, emergency preparedness. I'm not going to talk about all of those. You can read those on your own. Uh, the grading policy. This is where a lot of people will be interested in um, knowing what's going on here. So uh, the algorithm that you see here is one that we've used for a lot of classes for a number of years. So um, the first thing is at the end of the semester, we'll total up all your scores to give you a final score. Okay. Then what we'll do is we'll adjust everyone's final scores based on one of the highest scores in the class. Maybe the highest score in the class, maybe the second highest, maybe the third highest. That, that's up to the instructor. But basically, let's say that the, uh, the highest score in the class is a 95. What we'll do is we'll shift everyone's grades up by five points such that the highest score becomes a 100. So if the highest score is a 95, we'll shift everyone up by five points. So if you had, let's say, an 80, your new score would be an 85. Okay. Now, how much we shift it, I can't tell you, you know, until the very end. Okay. Um, but rest assured that your score will never go down. It'll only go, stay the same or go up. And it, it almost always goes up. Once you have your adjusted final score, then we'll use the university grading scheme that you see here. It's just a standard kind of grading scheme. It's an algorithm. We're not making any judgment calls here. It's just whatever you're, you know, we put it into a spreadsheet and what comes out of it is what your grade is. Now, how we get those scores, um, this, there are some big changes here from previous semesters. First of all, 20% of your final score will be based on homework. Okay. The 60% will be based on quizzes. 
and 20% will be based on the lab. So that adds up to 100. There are no exams. There is no final exam. Okay, it's just homework, quizzes, and labs. That's it for my section. So let me talk a little bit more about the homework. Uh, homework will be assigned and collected weekly. There'll be 14 homework assignments throughout the semester. Um, they'll all be posted on Brightspace, but you'll submit uh, submit via Gradescope. They'll be graded on Gradescope and returned to you on Gradescope. Uh, you, when you, I'm not going to go through everything in the in the um, on the page here, but um, there'll be six problems per assignment. You should work each problem on its own page. That just helps us um, organize things a little bit better. Um, we won't accept late homework for any reason. Okay, so if the homework is due at 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday night and you turn it in at 12.01 a.m. on Wednesday morning, doesn't we won't accept it. You'll get a zero for it for any reason. Okay, but what we'll do is we'll drop the two lowest homework scores uh, for the semester. So I said that there are 14 homework assignments. We'll only base your homework score on 12 of those assignments. Then we'll do that automatically. Whatever 12 are the highest, those are the ones that we'll use. So if you, um, you know, are sick for a week or two weeks, you can just drop those two homeworks if you can't get them done. You know, if your computer breaks down, uh, you know, your car breaks down somewhere, whatever reason, okay, we'll drop those two lowest homework scores. When we collect your homework and we grade it, we'll only grade a subset of the, the problems. So you'll have six problems we, that you submit. We'll grade three of them. And the reason for that, uh, I'd like to grade all six, but the reason we'll only grade three is just for manpower purposes. We, just, uh, we, we don't have enough people to do all the grading. It just takes too much time. So we'll grade three out of the six, and I'll just randomly choose which three. Another big change is this one, uh, item G. Homework assignments can be completed into teams of up to three people. So I want to, since we're going to do a lot of things virtually, I don't want people to feel isolated. So um, I encourage you to reach out to other uh, students in the course, and you can work into teams of up to three people to do the homework. So when you submit your homework assignment, all three people's names will go on that assignment, and you'll all get the same grade. Okay, so if you want to work as part of a team, you're more than welcome to do it. If you don't want to, that's fine. Just submit your, home, your own homework just like you normally would. But you can work as part of a team. Just keep in mind that everybody will get the same grade. And once you commit to a team, you really need to stay with that team. We don't want, you know, three people to say we're going to work together and then at the very end, you know, only two people's names go on it and then the third person somehow is left out. You know, you, you really need to commit to those teams. But you can switch teams from assignment to assignment if you prefer. Uh, don't use hard copy or online solutions um, for the homework, okay? Don't cheat on the homework. If you do get caught cheating, you'll get a zero for that whole 20%. So don't use resources like Chegg or things like that or prior homework um, um, solutions. Th homework is really just practice for you so that you'll do well on the quizzes. So, uh, you know, really do your best on these homeworks. There are plenty of resources to help you. I anticipate that most everyone will do very well on that 20% for their homework. As long as you're putting the time in, you'll do well, okay? So, so don't cheat on that. And uh, item I here really is just when you complete your homework assignments, I want them done neatly. I'll instruct the TAs that when they go ahead and grade the homework, if it's not worked neatly, they can take points off for that, okay? So it needs to be formatted well, uh, needs to be legible, uh, we need to be able to understand your solution methodology. Don't put, you know, problem, you know, part of the problem all over the page. If it's not organized, it's not going to get graded. Okay, so put the time and effort in to learn how to communicate your idea as well. And I have a, a document called the Advice for Preparing Written Assignments document that you should take a look at. Um, so you, you can see some advice I have. I give a little example of, of how to prepare a homework solution in that document. Quizzes. So 60% of your grade will be based on quizzes. These will be proctored. They'll be every Thursday at two different times. So from 8 to 9 a.m. and then from 8 to 9 p.m. on Thursdays. And they'll cover that week's homework assignment. So the homework will be due on Tuesdays at 11.59 p.m. The solutions will come out, you know, Wednesday morning right away. 
and then you'll have a quiz on that homework so you know that set of homework problems on Thursday it won't be the same you know the quiz won't cover an identical homework problem but it'll be of similar format quizzes will have conceptual questions as well as a worked out maybe one or two worked out questions uh, the quizzes are going to be designed so that you can solve them in about 30 minutes but we'll give you 60 minutes to work out the problems just to deal with you know downloading and uploading so what will happen is that it'll be posted on Gradescope the quiz it'll you know at 8 o'clock the quiz will appear on Gradescope you go ahead and work it and then you re-upload to, to Gradescope before 9 o'clock if you don't get it in by 9 o'clock you're gonna get a zero on that quiz okay so you need to make sure you budget your time effectively just like the homework um, we'll have 14 quizzes but I'll drop the two lowest quiz scores for whatever reason okay so if you if you miss a couple of quizzes it's not a big deal um, we're only gonna grade only 12 of them will count towards your final grade so when we proctor the quizzes we'll proctor them via zoom so you'll have a proctor who um, will use the microphone and camera on your um, on your computer when you work the quiz so you need to make sure you have a computer with a microphone and, and camera so that the proctor can see what you're doing while you work the quiz um, you don't have to pay for this this is not through examity or proctor track or anything like that it'll just be one of the me309 instructors or tas that monitors you while you're actually working the quiz and we'll there's a lot more information on taking the quizzes in this quiz information document you should take a look through um, we'll be recording those quizzes and hold on to the recordings for about a week um, in case there's any suspicion of cheating you know we'll review that recording and use it as evidence if there is some cheating event if, if there's nothing suspicious going on then after a week we'll delete the video recording and, and not worry about it but definitely take a look at that quiz information document because it, it has a lot more information there and then 20 percent of your final score will be based on the laboratory and that will be just covered by professor Vlacos. all right um, i give some additional notes here about um, you know regrades uh, the non-discrimination policy uh, the protect purdue plan i'm not going to go through these you should just read those on your own and then the last thing i'll talk about in this document is the schedule so you can see the schedule here these are uh, these are the topics that we'll cover in a particular order now the way i've done my video lectures is i don't do them in 50 minute increments i do them based on topic okay so if you take a look at um, the the brightspace page corresponding to my lecture you'll see a, a link that shows all of my lecture videos you'll see that a lot of those videos are less than 50 minutes in length some of them are actually longer than 50 minutes in length but I, i've been very careful to keep the tr track of the time so that you know all the time in the course um, doesn't exceed what i'm allowed to to uh, use so uh, because i've recorded the videos i know exactly how long they are um, so anyway uh, you can see the topics that we're going to cover in the course I've highlighted in yellow when homework is due I've highlighted in blue when the quizzes are uh, and I've also put the page numbers for the reading in Pritchard or this is the Fox and McDonald uh, book so you can follow along there and uh, so you'll want to take a look at that schedule just so you can see you know when things are due basically homework is due every Tuesday at 11 59 p.m. and then the quiz based on that homework will be on the Thursday in those two separate time periods and I'll, I'll talk more about the quizzes in a separate video and separate document all right so that should cover everything in the in the course syllabus if you have any questions about uh, any item in the syllabus just send me an email or put in a post a question on on Piazza and I'll try to answer it there okay now as far as uh, other documents let's see if there's something else I want to cover I was planning to, to cover uh, some additional documents, um, but rather than do that, I, I don't really think I need to go through any additional documents. Um, take a look at what's all posted on Brightspace. I have some advice for being successful in ME309, some advice for how to do some writing. Um, there's a spreadsheet for calculating your final grade. Uh, that spreadsheet it just allows you to figure out you know, where you stand in the course. It, it has the grading algorithm built into it. There's only one piece of information that none of us know until the very end, and that's that's the adjustment that I make. So you can you can play with various scenarios to see what impact that has on your final grade. Um, so anyway, take a look at that spreadsheet. 
Uh, the first few homework assignments are posted already on Brightspace, so you'll want to take a look at those. Uh, and the first quiz will be on September 1st, I believe it is. So you'll want to um, you'll want to take a look at that uh, on the schedule just so you're prepared. Let me just double check. Yeah, yeah. The first quiz is September 3rd. I apologize. First quiz is September 3rd. Okay, we'll go ahead and end the video there.